Would you like to accelerate your career and reach your full potential in just minutes a day? Welcome to the LeadX Show with New York Times bestselling author and Inc. 500 entrepreneur, Kevin Cruz. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the LeadX Leadership Show. I am Kevin Cruz. And once again, we are going to try to help you to become the boss you always wish you had yourself. Now, on today's show, I interview a senior leader from Facebook. We're going to hear about her journey from being a frontline manager at a young age, long before Facebook had a leadership development program, what she learned from it, and her advice, which she's now put into a brand new book. We're also going to hear about how way back when, not everybody knows this, Mark Zuckerberg turned down a billion dollars with a B because he believed in the vision so much and he was so compelling. Everybody else believed in the vision too. The team members at Facebook, maybe the investors were mad, but the team members totally supported him. And we're going to get all kinds of great advice. Um, before we start this interview, remember, leadx.org is where you can get a free trial of the LeadX app with Coach Amanda. It's your personal coach powered by IBM Watson. Discover your big five personality, pick a developmental goal. Coach Amanda will be your accountability buddy checking in with you week in and week out, making sure you're making progress on your action plan. And if that isn't enough, we've got thousands of five minute long micro learning videos, book summaries, and other digital assets to support your leadership journey. So my guest today, she is the VP of product design at Facebook she leads a large team there today, but when she started, she was in her mid-20s when she became a frontline manager for the first time. She also writes about technology, design, and leadership on the very popular blog, The Year of the Looking Glass, and she's written for publications like the New York Times and Fast Company. She lives in California with her husband and two kids. She is the author of the new book, The Making of a Manager, Please enjoy my conversation with Julie Zhu. Julie, officially welcome to the LeadX Leadership Show. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Um, I loved your book, loved your story, and I'm excited to talk uh, about your journey and evolution as a, as a leader, as a manager. And, you know, I mentioned in the intro that you are now um, VP of Design at Facebook, but take us back. I mean, tell us a little bit about your career journey and, um, you know, how you ended up where you are today. Sure. So I graduated college and I decided to take a risk and join this little startup that was called Facebook at the <laughs> time. This is 2006. Uh, you know, Facebook was a college site. It was replacing the college Facebook, you know, that freshman get. I just graduated from college. I felt like I was the perfect audience. I'd been using the product for a number of years. I loved it. I had some friends who worked there. So I joined actually as Facebook's very first intern. As wow. you know, they didn't really have a program. I just you know, decided to get in there, sneak in. Uh, I was, was an engineer for a period of time. Then I decided I really wanted to focus on front-end development and mm. design. And then just over these years, shifted towards design. Hmm. At the age of 25, you know, very lucky to be at a company that's growing, you know, lots of opportunities, we're hiring more people. My manager, and she was, you know, leading the design team at the, at the time said, you know, hey, we're growing. I've got more reports than I know what to do with. I need another manager. You know, how about you? Will you do it? And, you know, I'm used to being in this kind of startup environment where you're often thrown in, you know, you're being asked to wear different hats, you're doing things you've never done before. So I was just like, sure, like on the spot. Yeah, absolutely. I'll help out where I'm needed. Uh, and it was only, I think, a, a couple of days later, we had made the announcement, you know, I was now sitting down with, uh, you know, like having a one on one for the very first time with somebody who would report to me. And I'm just like, wow, I really don't know what I'm doing. Like, what should I be asking this one on one? You know, like, what value can I provide to this person? Like, I actually think he's a better designer than I am. And so all of those kind of emotions and, and, and you know, sort of uh, that was sort of the start of it. Uh, and I, you know, over the, you know, so now it's been about 10 years and, you know, I've, I've grown in, in that and I've started to manage larger and larger teams. Today, I oversee the entirety of the design and research team for the Facebook 
product and service. So, you know, whatever you go on Facebook, you interact, you share a photo, you like a comment, you know, that's the work that my team is responsible for. And, you know, I wanted to really write this book because when I look back at when I was 25, I have this memory of going to the bookstore and trying to find some resources Mm -hmm. about management. And, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of really, really great stuff, but, you know, most of the books tend to be focused on a particular like big idea or a particular organizational trend. You know, here's the research that we just learned. And if you put this into practice, things are going to be a lot better for your team. There wasn't that much that was just, hey, here's the basics. You know, here's everything you need to know. Here's even why we have managers. Here's how you should think about a one-on-one. Here's, you know, how you should run a meeting. Here's how you should think about hiring. You know, things that were almost like more textbooky, but in a way that was written to be accessible for someone who honestly just wasn't very confident in it herself and, and kind of wanted that, that level of uh, training. And, you know, I know that many other companies, especially bigger companies, when you become a manager, there's lots of resources, you know, there's training programs, like you're kind of on a path or trajectory. For me at that point in my life, you know, I was at kind of a startup-y environment, so we didn't really have that. And so, you know, I do think it's quite common probably in Silicon Valley and especially in this modern era, you know, where oftentimes, you know, the the reason you have a team is because you had a big idea and you gathered these people. You weren't necessarily setting out to be a manager. It just became a byproduct of how you were going to achieve your goals. And so I think it's quite common to actually be in that situation where, you know, you find yourself managing people and you don't, uh, you don't really maybe have that support structure or training to, to prepare you for it. So you're going to discover Julie that <laughs> when I do these interviews, like you just triggered so much stuff. I'm going to ask you all my, my selfish questions first, but I promise we'll talk more specifically about the making of a manager, yeah. but like all these other questions hit my, my mind. And so, you know, at the time when you said like, sure, I'll be a manager without really thinking it through, there was no formal new manager academy or new manager training program at Facebook, I guess. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Yes. Uh, Because we were all, you know, it's like we're just trying to make things work. We're all focused on the big idea, you know, and most of the people who were managers hadn't ever really managed before. It was just because we were growing and we kind of needed people to take care of hiring and, you know, figuring out process and other things. Now, um, this is a question that I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying to make you say something critical of, of Facebook, uh, but you obviously have a new manager training program in place. You have a, a department now. And what I see in many organizations, you know, they call it the knowing doing gap. So we, we put people into these workshops and give them tools and all the rest, but just because we know how to be a good manager, we know how to be a great leader, doesn't mean we actually do it when we get back on the job. We go into task mode rather than, than people mode. Um, so now, I mean, Facebook's a totally different place than 06. When new managers, first time frontline managers come out of it, do you think like, oh yeah, like they don't need my book and there's not a lot I could teach them because we're doing it. They're coming out different than I did. Or is there still a gap that has to be closed somehow from when they come out of your new manager training program and have to manage in the real world? That's a great question. I'm really, really proud of Facebook's approach to management. I actually think we have an excellent discipline. And a lot of it is because, you know, culturally, we really, really care about it. And as a company, you know, we we really care about the experience that people have. And, you know, that may not always be true. And, you know, certainly at the very beginning, when we were a startup, we were probably more focused around, you know, the product and just kind of, you know, doing something and and making sure we were, you know, satisfying customer needs and that we could successfully grow. You know, but today I actually, I think that part of a great management program and training isn't like, hey, you just take a class and now you know everything. You know, it involves mentorship. It involves, you know, having support groups of people you can talk to. It involves your manager being very hands-on with you about coaching you to be a manager. You know, I think at the end of the day, great management, great leadership is contextual, right? There's no, here's the black or white, you know, it's not like a formula. Uh, It's, it's different based on, you know, the person, like the manager's personality, as well as the personality and, and kind of, you know, unique, uh, you know, aspects of the people on her team. It's contextual to like, what does the team need to do? What does success look like for that team? And so, so much of learning how to be successful is, you know, you're, you're kind of in the moment, you know, working on these particular 
problems, situations, opportunities, and having a, a group and a support structure and you know all of the resources at your disposal to, I think, have the confidence to to go move forward. Yeah, and you you mentioned something that I've been hearing, or at least like I think I'm noticing the word more, which is context, contextual, and as I you know, every year ticks by being a leader, more and more, I find myself answering, it depends. <laughs> you know, there, there isn't always one black or white answer on, uh, on a lot of these uh, people issues. Um, and, and the other question I had, again, just from a, a selfish standpoint, the, you know, you joined Facebook and at a time, you know, when it was, you, you rode the rocket ship ride, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, like I have two, my oldest girls are in college now. They'll be looking for jobs, you know, very, very soon. I have young people who listen to the show or read my books, you know, right in. And often they say, when I'm in my 20s, what kind of company should I try to join? Should I join a big logo company like, you know, Facebook or others that um, it'd be prestigious and it's like top class and be great to have that on my resume? Or should I try to join a smaller startup that's that I can do that rocket ship ride because I'm going to learn so much and, you know, re, really be in the midst. I'll, I'll make an impact. Um, now, again, like you, <laughs> I'm curious, you've gone through this trajectory now. What is your advice to young people who might ask you the same thing? Following your early Julie years and join that crazy startup or like, no, no, there's a lot of value in waiting and, and joining something larger. You know, I'm going to go back to the answer you just gave, which was, <laughs> it depends. <laughs> I knew uh, you'd say that. <laughs> uh, how did you guess? No, uh, but, you know, I uh, personally, when I think about, you know, what my 20s were, or, or maybe even the first three or five years uh, after I was out of college and I was, you know, uh, trying to make it in this big, big world, um, the thing that's so important to me uh, when I look back on it is just being able to try new things and learning because you're at this point in your life where, you know, it's very hard to answer questions like, what do you really want to do? What mm -hmm. matters to you? What are your values? You know, what are you good at and what are you not good at? And you can't really begin to, you know, I know some people come out of college and they're like, I have this master plan for my life. And I'm always like, how do you know what you like? How do you know what you don't like unless you try it, unless you put yourself out there you know, continually in these uncomfortable situations um, until you, you you can, again, then, you know, maybe your 30s, 40s, answer those questions with more conviction, you know, the conviction yeah. that comes from having done it for a period of time. And so I never, you know, uh, I, I, I always try and like tell people who are young, like, you know, keep your options open and don't be afraid to take those risks and don't be afraid to be like, you know, maybe I'm going to do this thing. And the most, like, you'll always get something out of it. You'll always learn. You'll probably improve your skills, but more importantly, you'll learn about yourself. And, uh, and, you know, in my book, I have this whole chapter around managing yourself because honestly, I found the things that have helped me become the most effective as a manager to someone else, you know, as a leader who can influence a team is my own understanding of who I am, you know, what my strengths are, what my gaps are, what my blind spots and biases tend to be, what my values are, and getting to that kind of, you know, uh, a deep understanding of myself, which both helps me figure out how to create an environment that that makes me more effective, but also helps me better connect with people and know, here's the team that I should build that lets me play to my strengths, but that also accounts for my own weaknesses. Now, that was a perfect setup because I was getting ready to ask about the book. And the very first question is, and it's your chapter five, managing yourself. And, and I try to tell people that too, you know, leadership, there's even if you don't have any authority or team, there's always at least self-management and self-leadership. And in the, the beginning of the chapter, you talk about a time when you thought you needed some help and support at work and you got an executive coach. And I always have to clarify because LeadX has a robot, an AI powered executive coach. You had a human executive coach. Mm -hmm. So tell us about that time and you know, what did you learn from it? So this was a period I had just come back from work after my first baby. You know, so I'd taken three or four months off. I came back and I just found myself in probably the lowest point in my career. Now, going back, you know, with the clarity of hindsight, you know, I think what I what I was truly feeling was that I had just gone through this major life shift. I was a new mother. I wasn't yet confident in my myself as a mother. 
And so that lack of confidence started to bleed through to every other aspect of my life and it affected me and the job. And suddenly I'm coming back after not being at work for three or four months and I'm sort of looking at everything going well. And instead of celebrating that, because frankly, you know, it's like if things are going well, it means I set the team up well. I started to question, you know, am I really, does this mean I'm not adding value? Does this mean that I'm not really good at anything, you know? And and I, you know, I, I felt myself feeling this immense amount of self-doubt And I, you know, I know it's actually very common for all managers to go through at some point in your career. You don't always feel on top of the world. You don't always feel like, rah, I've got it. I'm the best. Uh, But this was a particularly low and challenging point. And that was when I decided to, you know, one of my major learnings through that period is like, you know, it's okay for me to ask for help. I can admit it. You know, when I started to be able to admit that, you know, how much I was struggling, my lack of self-confidence, when I when I became able to admit that to my own manager and to my peers and ask them for help, I found tons of support. I found tons of, you know, empathy and understanding. And, you know, that was how, as part of, part of that, I got a coach. Uh, and, and one of the things the coach did for me, which was so, so valuable, is she just, she did this 360 feedback process. She talked to, you know, the 10 or so people that I worked with the closest and just, you know, spent like 45 minutes in conversation about me. And she delivered this report that was like, hey, you know, you don't believe in yourself. You're clearly going through a lot, but this is what your peers had to say. And, you know, it wasn't like everything was positive. I mean, clearly there were things that I needed to work on, but it was also kind of like the ground truth. You know, it was like, okay, once I could really internalize this, this is where it was. And where I was is honestly a lot better than all of those scenarios playing my mind where I was like, I can't do anything. I just, I feel emotional all the time. You know, I don't feel like I'm adding any value and that's not at all what my peers saw. And so that helped ground me. And Mm -hmm. that I think is so critical. You know, like some days we do think we're much better than maybe we actually are because, you know, we're biased to think that way. Some days our inner critic is much harder on us than we actually are because, you know, that also happens. And the reality is, you know, we're probably somewhere in that middle. There's always things to work on, but there's probably lots of things that we're doing well. And we just need that calibration, you know, with right. reality um, and, and in order to give us that, that confidence that we can keep moving forward. Now, I think often when people go through uh, like a 360 or, or some other kind of strengths assessment, you know, they discover that. Um, often our developmental areas um, are really just the the shadow side of our strengths. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I might get good marks for being a real driver, an activator, take action kind of guy. And then people will say, you know, he's not very social. He doesn't give me enough time. It's hard to catch his attention. It's kind of the opposite Mm -hmm. of all all those things. Did you find that your strengths and and developmental areas kind of mirrored each other? Absolutely. I think, you know, our personality is kind of always just like a double-edged sword. That that sounds, I don't know, that's the best analogy, but you know, like the things that make us so great in one dimension often are the things that make us uh, maybe blind to other situations. Right. And, you know, for, for me, um, for a long time, you know, I got all sorts of praise. Like I was thoughtful, I was empathetic. I listened well to other people, you know, I deliberated before making choices, but then on on the downside, it's like I often struggled to voice my opinion in a meeting because I, I needed to deliberate, you know, I needed to like mm-hmm. have that 30 minutes. And so I was always kind of quiet, you know, uh, maybe I, I could, you know, spend too long deliberating and, you know, I wasn't action oriented enough and I didn't move as quickly as I could. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I am still who I am, but being cognizant of those areas, you know, right having that time to be like, okay, let's look at this situation. Is this a situation where we actually need a lot of deliberation or does it matter more to move quickly? Cause maybe the decision is reversible once we get more information, but it's, you know, over time I've developed frameworks and ways to think about how I can make sure that my strengths can, you know, I'm still good at all the things I'm doing, but I also, you know, need to be aware of moments in which my natural inclination may not lead to the best decision or outcome. How long did you work with that coach during that time? Uh, I mean, I still continue to work with that coach. And so yeah, that's great. been ongoing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think in an ideal world, we, we all should have a coach of some sort forever. It's not a, it, it doesn't have to just end. There's always something to, to, to work on or to gain additional awareness. Uh, yeah. 
Yes. But I also have learned too that it, having a, an executive coach is it's wonderful, right? It's like someone, you know, we have regular sessions every two or, or three weeks, but you also can get a lot of that value out of, you know, a peer or someone that you consider a mentor. It just frankly needs to be a person you trust who, you know, has enough context on you and what you're going through. And, you know, sometimes it's not, it's, it's more, I think the process of being able to talk about some of the things that you're going through and have a period of reflection. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the thing my coach provides for me, is it that she knows she, she doesn't listen to my problems and just prescribes me a solution. She listens and she asks questions back and she gets me to reflect and to think about, you know, okay, how might I solve my own problems? And and that's actually to me what great coaching is. And you can have that with lots of different people. You know, for example, I have a of some people that I go to for specific problems around management, like a you know, other peers who have managed larger teams than I have, right. who have kind of seen the problems I've gone through. I have a group that I talk to about, you know, problems specific to my my trade or my profession design you know it's like we talk about where industry trends are going we talk about you know kind of the new challenges facing designers year on year over year uh i have people i could talk to about other personal matters or parenting you know whatever it is and i think you can create these support you know trusted people mentors or support networks and they don't have to be just one person it could be many many people who who you know uh who help you with that aspect of getting to know yourself better yeah that's great and i also wanted to ask you have another chapter all on the art of feedback and um you know one of the the favorite books of last year guests of last year was was uh kim scott who wrote you know radical candor yeah. and um you know i I was horrible at giving feedback in most of my early career. And it goes back to personality. I mean, I'm very non-confrontational and and all this stuff. Um, So I was great. Like, okay, you've identified this as like a primary thing managers need to get right or should get right early on. So tell us about the art of feedback. The first thing I always say is, you know, feedback is not just the words and if you say them or whatever, it's, it's about the context. It's, it's built on a foundation of relationship that you have with someone else, right? Your best friend can say something like, wow, you look ugly in that green sweater. And you're going to be like, I'm not offended. You know, she's clearly saying it because she wants to help me out. A stranger could say that and you're like, well, that's really rude. You know, that person, you know, needs to go and take a chill pill or whatever. So, you know, it's not about the words. It's about actually the context of the relationship. And the more that you're able to have that trusting relationship with someone, the easier it is to be able to, you know, talk openly and honestly. And sometimes being upfront, like, hey, this is what we want our relationship to be. This is what we want. You know, like I want to feel comfortable when you give me critical feedback and vice versa. So, you know, I think just focusing on the actual, like, how are you with this person? Like, would you admit your vulnerabilities to each other? Julie, can you go more specific on that? Like, so this is great. Like, if you have that relationship of trust, then you can say some pretty direct things, right? Mm -hmm. But how do you, let's say you've got a new team member that comes on board these days. What are some things you might do to build trust, to build uh, like this psychological safety for for feedback? Mm-hmm. The first is just get to know the other person, ask questions, you know, get to know them as a person, right? Not just the output of their work, but what are they really like? What are their values? Where do they see their career in three years? You know, what do they consider their strengths? What do they want to do more of? What do they want to do less of? And just listen, you know, and really internalize that. I think the second thing you could do is just share as well more about yourself, You know, a lot of times if we want other people to be open and vulnerable with us, we have to start and show that ourselves. And so oftentimes, you know, I like to tell people, hey, here's here's who I am. And by the way, here's what I think I'm good at. Here's things I don't think I'm good at or that I'm working on or that I've gotten feedback in the past that, you know, I can be to this or to that. And I just want you to be aware of it. And, you know, please feel free to call me out on it if that happens. Right. But that's me also, you know like show you that I'm human. I'm not some perfect person, you know, and, and therefore I I want you to feel like you can be human with me as well. I think the third thing is over time, you know, you've listened, you've understood that person, like do things that really help them. If Mm -hmm. you are coming in and you're only thinking about your own goals and what you need from that person and what that person can do for you, you know, you're not going to come across as like truly caring about that other person. Part of asking and understanding 
setting their own goals is that you might be able to then look for opportunities for them to do more of what they love, or you might, you know, be able to help them achieve that goal. Maybe they want to be a manager one day. Maybe they want to be a lead. Maybe they want to, I don't know, get better at public speaking. And you're finding those opportunities to help them on their path. Yeah, I think that's great. Once they know that you really are trying to be their coach or guide along the way, then even the the tough messages are going to be received in the right uh, context. Okay, so the last area of the book, I, I'm keeping one eye on time and I'm loving this so much that um, all my commuters are going to have to sit in the car when they get to work and just wait for the end of, of this episode. Um, I, I'm a nut about time and productivity. Like, Time is life, you know, so, so I, I've written on it. I think about it. I uh, really reflect on it. And again, you know, you've got a chapter about, you know, making things happen. And, and there's a side to um, you, being a manager, being a leader that, that's about the people stuff. But ultimately, we also have to get stuff done. We have to make things happen. So give us some of your tips for this, this side of the, the role. Mm -hmm. I think the most important thing is just to ensure that your team has all the same picture of what success looks like. You know, I find a lot of times if you have hired great people and, you know, they're good at what they do, uh, a lot, like the, the biggest mistake that happens is like they, they don't actually have the same definition of what success looks like or what they're all aspiring to do. And so spending a lot of time, you know, talking about the why with your team, why are we doing this? Why, why do these things matter? And also the what does, you know, a perfect job look like? If we were all, you know, at our very, very best, or we were all like 2x better than where we are, or 3x mm -hmm. or 5x, what does that look like? And how would we be, you know, and make that as tangible as possible, right? As clear of a picture as you can, uh, because, you know, you, 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 uh, it's, much, it's much more effective than trying to like micromanage all of the little decisions that everyone's going through. Uh, so those are, I think, the first two places to start. And then the third is just, Ensuring that the norms around, uh, you know, how we solve problems, because we also we also know that we can never perfectly predict anything. You know, maybe you have a good idea of like what success looks like, but you know, you also get new information. Your assumptions were wrong. Here's a fire that came out that you didn't account for. In those situations, what are the norms? for how the team solves those things, right? And um, and and having a clear set of, okay, like if this happens, like, okay, who's on point? What are our values then? You know, do we, uh, do we really value just sort of like escalation and decision-making and framing and clarity? Or, you know, do we, what else do we, you know, uh, uh, kind of value? I think that helps people then have a framework for understanding uh, kind of, you know, okay, this, a thing happened, here's who I should pull in, here's, you know, what kind of meetings we should hold, and, or, and here's ultimately how we resolve it in the most efficient way. So making sure those norms are, are clear and established. Makes sense. Um, and, and you mentioned about the why, and in this chapter, you talk about, um, uh, you know, you have to talk about how everything relates to vision. And you talk about, uh, you have a little story that I think a lot of people don't, don't know, which is that early on, um, Mark Zuckerberg received a billion dollar offer to sell the company and he turned it down, which he's talked publicly about being a really difficult time in Facebook's career and his, his life. Now, were you there when that happened? I was, yes. You remember this? Mm -hmm. I do. So what did, what did you think, what did people think about when word got out that there was some significant offer that he say, no thanks. And this is one thing that I believe Mark, you know, as a leader does so, so well, he continues to do this well, but even back then he did this well, he did such a good job of, uh, you know, sort of painting that vision, at least for his employees. You know, when I joined, it wasn't like, hey guys, you know, we're great. We're like a college network. Lots of people are using us. He was always like, look, there, there's an opportunity to connect the world. And even though MySpace is 10, you know, 10 times bigger than us, the, the world is like billions of people. And, you know, there's an opportunity for us to do, for, to like provide a service that helps connect these billions of people online. And I remember very early on in Facebook's trajectory, you know, we were, we were, we were throwing in around numbers, like one day we will connect a billion people. And keep <laughs> in mind, this is like when we were like, 8 million, you know, 10 million, to, like it's <laughs> ludicrous, you know, it's almost like horribly arrogant, right. To actually you had to be a little crazy, I yeah, guess. <laughs> to even think in those terms, but you know, that was how all of the employees, like we like really believed that we could do that. We had no doubt in our mind that like, you know, we had that opportunity and we just had to execute really well and work hard. And we believed in our product. And so 
I know that, you know, Mark got a ton of pressure from investors and mentors and advisors and so forth, but actually with the employee base, you know, all, we kind of cheered when he's, you know, when he said, we're just going to continue to work on that vision. You know, we were like, yeah, we, cause we saw it, you know, we knew we, we kind of had that idea that like, this was a much bigger opportunity in front of us. That's fantastic. It does. Uh, that really is a, a testament to the communication of the vision and, and as audacious as it was, that it was also believable and motivating. You know, none of you said, oh, bummer. I was hoping to check out at this point. You're like, yeah, let's, let's keep on. That's really yeah. incredible. And I mean, I, I mean, I, I might not be speaking for like, you know, but I knew that people like me, you know, we were young, we had joined a company a few years ago. We, we loved this product. We had been, been a huge part of our lives in college. Like, you know, it was easy right. for us to believe that we could be, be much bigger. Right. Right. So, um, I want to wrap up again with a selfish thing. So this has got to be one of the best uh, recent book titles, The Making of a Manager, right? And um, who came up with that title? Was it you? Was it the publisher? No, we, it was, you know, I probably, I, we like bandied around a lot of, you know, names in a, right. a brainstorm session. And I think I might've thrown this out there. Uh, everyone's like, yeah, you know, that, that actually, I think really conveys the spirit of the book. It's direct. It's clever. It gives a chuckle to the, to the Netflix series. Yes. I, I really just think it's, Awesome. I think it's awesome. And I'm sure SEOs very well uh, also. <laughs> um, so Julie, this has been fantastic. Tell our listeners and our viewers, um, how can they find out more about the making of a manager and follow uh, your, your work? So making a manager is out now. It's available at all major retailers, Amazon, you know, you can find it on Kindle, on Audible. Uh, you can also go to my website, Julie Zhu, Z H U O dot com. It has a bunch of, you know, interviews, podcasts, events, other things. I've been writing a blog for a really long time about, you know, design and technology and product. Very well read, famous blog. Everybody should check it out if you have any interest yeah. in design at all. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and that is available as well, a link to from my website. And, you know, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook. My handle is at Julie, J O U L E E. Fantastic. We will put all of those links in the show notes and the articles, make sure people get to the right place. Julie, thanks for spending so much time with the LeadX uh, listeners and sharing your story and advice. All right. Thanks so much. This was a real pleasure. Awesome. Thanks. Friends, if you like this episode of the LeadX Leadership Podcast, please take a minute, leave a rating on iTunes or Stitcher. Ratings are invaluable for attracting new listeners. And I like to convert those listeners into leaders because, you know, I'm on a mission to spark 100 million leaders in the next 10 years. And if you want to become the boss everyone fights to work for and nobody wants to leave, check out the LeadX platform with Coach Amanda at LeadX.org. And if you have 10 or more managers who could use some binge-worthy training, send me an email at info at LeadX.org, L-E-A-D-X dot O-R-G. And we'll talk about getting you set up with a totally free pilot for those managers. See if they like it. If they don't, that's fine. We go away. Part as friends. But if they love it, you've just found yourself a new resource for them. Remember, leadership is influence. You're always leading. How are you going to lead today? <laughs>